right, thank you. When I was uh, sharing earlier tonight about Jim Kreider, I forgot to mention, too, that uh, Jim and his wife, Linda, they're our head deacons here at Grace Community Church, and so I get to work uh, closely with them as um, opportunities that our church has as we get to work with uh, families or individuals in our church, and so they spend a lot of time uh, just being able to really care for people at the church. So just keep them in prayer. I know they are very faithful going to hospitals, visiting people, and so for him sitting in the hospital and uh, just not being able to, to uh, be able to do what he wants to do, uh, just keep him in prayer as they just navigate that. So I'm excited to be able to be here tonight. I got asked to be able to share for the men's group, so excited to be able to do that. And as Todd referenced earlier, um, I guess it, irony, I, I don't, I'm not sure what else to say to it, but um, I, I'm glad to be here, but I was trying to enjoy, uh, avoid the plague at home to be able to come and speak about the plagues from the Bible. So I don't know exactly how that correlates, but um, you probably know people, families, there's a bug going around, people get and so forth, and so uh, over the weekend that had hit our family, and so I was just trying to be able to avoid that, and so that's why I told, told, told Todd that he was uh, kind of on call, um, so to make sure everything was all right, so, but I believe after tonight we're good because it's recorded, so Thursday morning if they have to, they can just hit play if I don't, if I don't make it till Thursday, so. Um, so tonight, uh, the theme, the big idea we're going to be looking at, I was asked to, to uh, preach on, is that God provides. And so we're going to be looking at the exodus of God's people and looking at three different ways in how God provides. But I know we're looking and studying through the um, character of Moses. So we're going to look at Moses as we go, up, go throughout this tonight and uh, talk. And uh, we have Exodus 5 through 12, so seven chapters, so... We're going to kind of not be able to do a whole lot of detail tonight. I'm going to try to talk through a number of things, but just to be able to kind of get through 5 to 12 and kind of keep you with what's happening. Uh, so I challenge you that if you go home to read Exodus 5 to 12, you'll read it and realize that in a few minutes that you read the whole thing just because it really just is a narrative that just really carries over very easily and that you can get a lot of the details. It was a rich study. Um, I enjoyed being able to do that. Uh, I was talking with Pastor Mike this morning, and he asked what I was preaching, and so I told him Exodus chapter 5 through 12, and he goes, that's weird. They only asked me to preach 12 verses. Why did they have you preach so much? And I said, I said, Pastor Mike, they don't want to stay here till Thursday, so that's why you only got 12 verses. So, <laughs> so anyways, we're going to kind of go through and uh, talk about that, and we're also going to talk about Pharaoh a little bit too. I think he does and doesn't do some stuff that's uh, pretty important too that we can discuss. So Let's jump into some background. I want to give you some background as we're, as we're getting into the exodus of God's people and what's going on. And so if you're unsure what's going on, maybe perhaps you didn't grow up in the church and hear about Moses, the plagues, and Pharaoh, is basically we find ourselves in a clash between Pharaoh and God. And then Moses and Aaron are basically God's spokesmen during, during this clash in Exodus chapter 5 verse, uh, through chapter 12. And so for the past 400 years, the Israelites have been slaves in Egypt, and uh, God has heard their cries, and he has decided to set a plan into motion to be able to free the Israelites out of Egypt and uh, to be able to let them eventually get to the promised land. So for starters, I want to share a little bit about who Pharaoh is among the Egyptians. Some of you may know something about Pharaoh, some of you may not know a whole lot, so just bear with me as I share, because I think it's very impactful as we're talking about this clash that's happening between the God of the Israelites and Pharaoh, uh, the leader of the Egyptians. Um, the Egyptians believed that Pharaoh was the mediator between the gods and the world of men. After death, the Pharaoh became divine. But while he was alive, Pharaoh held absolute power in Egypt. Pharaoh owned all the land in Egypt. He enacted laws, collected taxes, and defended Egypt from invaders as the commander-in-chief in the army and navy. And besides being the supreme commander of the army and navy, Pharaoh was also the chief justice of the royal court, high priest of the country's religion. And when it came down to it, Pharaoh was considered a god by his people. So you can see how this clash is going to take place, basically, that the god of the Israelites is setting a plan into motion, trying to accomplish something. Pharaoh, who thinks he's a god and has been doing stuff for 400 years, is trying to do something, and they're going to be at odds. So that brings us to our first truth about the 
exodus of God's people and how God provides. The first way is that God promises deliverance. And we see that uh, beginning in Exodus chapter 5. So as we, go out th- as we go throughout the night, I'm going to read portions of Scripture. Again, I think it does a really good job of explaining what's going on. And I'll share some details, but I have a number of Scriptures I'd like to read with you. But God promises deliverance and that plagues are coming. So join with me in Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. It says, Afterward, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. I don't know about you, but I heard a little bit of pride and arrogance in those verses there coming from Pharaoh that he doesn't even know who the Lord is and uh, comes off pretty prideful there. So he tells Moses that's not going to happen. I don't even know who your God is. And so... Imagine Moses, the story that you guys have that we're going through. Moses, there's a bunch of highs and lows. I think this story alone, there's a bunch of highs and there's a bunch of lows. And it creates, I think, Moses to be uh, very much questioning God along the way when he hits the extreme lows. And then he gets to see some really cool things as God gets to show his divine power. Not only uh, Moses and Aaron get to see, but obviously all of the Egyptians. So despite God promising deliverance, Moses is depressed. Join me as I read Exodus chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and find out exactly why, why is Moses depressed. It says, Moses returned to the Lord and said, Why, Lord, have you brought trouble on this people? Is this why you sent me? Ever since I went to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has brought trouble on this people, and you've not rescued your people at all. So Moses, depressed, doesn't see what God's doing, begins to start questioning God, saying, You said you were going to do something. Are, are you really going to do it? And so uh, what's, what's going on in this is that when, when Moses went to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, and Pharaoh said, I don't know who this Lord is, I'm not letting you go, he actually then punished the Israelites by making them do more work. So they already were their slaves, they already were doing work that was due so much every day, a quota that they had, and Pharaoh all of a sudden didn't give them more time or people or, or resources, but said they had to come up with the resources and had to do more work. So the people, the Israelites... Very unhappy, Um, and so Moses is kind of thinking, what is going on here? Things are, like the wheels are falling off. We're not going forward. Things are starting to come and fall off. So this gets us to Exodus chapter 6, verses 9 and 12. And Moses, he gets rejected by both the Israelites and by Pharaoh. It says, Moses reported to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the Israelites go out of this country. But Moses said to the Lord, If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me, since I speak with faltering lips? So Moses was, by God, he went to the Pharaoh to tell him, Let my people go. Pharaoh says no to that. He goes to the Israelites to tell them that God said that that God's going to free us and we're going to leave. And the Israelites were punished with more labor, and they're like, Moses, thanks, but can you just stop talking? Life is getting a lot worse the more talking you're doing, so can you please stop doing that? So I don't know, if, I don't know about you guys, but if you guys ever been in a situation that you really can't please anybody, no matter where you go, you try to be able to, you're talking, and you just can't win uh, no matter what. So Moses has to be very discouraged, um, but the Lord tells Moses, that he has a plan of deliverance, and he tells him this in Exodus chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of this country. So that brings us to Exodus chapter 7, and through chapter 7 through chapter 12 is when the plagues start to take place. And again, we have 30 minutes tonight, so I can't really go deep down into the details with them, but I wanted to read the plagues to you because if you're not familiar, maybe you didn't grow up in the church, just what plagues did God bring to the Egyptians um, as he was trying to be able to free the Israelites. So just listen as I read um, and just imagine being in a land where this all is kind of taking place back to back to back to back. So the first plague as we start in Exodus chapter 7 was that the Nile was turned to blood. The Nile was the main river 
there in Egypt. It's where they got their water, their resources to be able to do everything they need to do. And all of a sudden, it was turned into blood. All the fish in there died. And so therefore, there wasn't water. So major problem. Plague number two. Frogs came out of the Nile and all of a sudden go, went all over the land, all over the palace, all over the houses. So you can imagine trying to get anything done, being any what productive, and just frogs everywhere, keeping you from being productive, driving you nuts. You're, you're stepping on them. You're walking through them, trying to do everything. And then the third plague, gnats. Out of the dust, gnats were formed. And imagine just, I mean, gnats are annoying and just being there constantly. And then it gets worse. You get to the fourth plague, flies. Flies everywhere. Fifth plague, you have dead livestock. So all of a sudden your animals are dying. Plague number six, boils on your body. So you're getting pain, your, your skin's getting all messed up. And then plague number seven, hail. So your crops, your animals, um, your land starting to get destroyed. And I'm summarizing this. I mean, it's obviously, this is, this is not good. Plague number eight, locusts. So anything that the hail didn't take out, the locusts did. So all of a sudden your land is uh, just decimated. Um, there's no plants. Um, and so imagine here in Lancaster County, you're a farmer. All your livestock's dead. All the plants are dead. All your fields are unfarmable. And then you get to go up and get the uh, great job of going to work trying to figure out what to do. Doesn't sound too fun. And then plague number nine, darkness. Three days, just darkness. So you can't even do anything, can't go anywhere. And then plague number 10 is the death of the firstborn. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. But I want to go back up and talk about one example real quick about the plagues. Um, plague number four, the flies. I thought I'd share a little personal story with you because I always think about the plagues um, in this situation. I got asked earlier tonight um, about if I ever work on the farm. And if, if you know me a little bit at all, my in-laws are farmers. And so I, I, I married into that. So I've, I've been educated a little bit with that. But um, every summer, I take two weeks, and I go, and I, I work on the farm. And it's usually the two hottest weeks of the year. And so I enjoy, love working here at Grace Community Church. I'm not, it's not because I'm looking to change employment at all, but I go and do that. There's some help on the farm to be able to do, and um, being able to, i trying to just pay off my house. So I go, and I, I work for two weeks on the farm. And so one of the jobs I do, my in-laws, they have chickens, and so one of the jobs I do is I spend a good part of the day in their chicken houses. I got asked permission to share this story, but I'll share a little bit about with what I do. So as you go into the chicken houses, you have to remember it's the, it's the two hottest weeks of the year. And so you have to go into the chicken house. And one of the main things going into the chicken house is you have to make sure the chickens are okay. And if there's any dead ones, you got to take them out. And uh, in the chicken houses, there can be up to 125,000 chickens in each chicken house. So it's a little bit of number of chickens in there, a little bit of walking, trying to go through all the rows and uh, to be able to check that. And it, there's uh, some issues with doing that. So it's, it's really hot outside. You're going into a chicken house with 125,000 125, chickens. So that creates heat. And then the way the chicken houses are designed below all, both of the chicken houses, that's called a pit. That's where all the manure goes. All right. So with a chicken house where you have chickens, manure, you have mice. It's really hot, and I'll let you Google, but you have to wear overhauls as you walk through and check for the chickens, because the ones that are alive, I'll let you Google, but when a chicken gets nervous, uh, that, be, that creates an interesting dynamic uh, that uh, is not fun to deal with. And so with all those things, they also invite a lot of flies, and so you literally have clouds of flies just everywhere. You're not just saying, oh, there's one in the corner. They're literally everywhere. So as I walked through and spent about half the day in the chicken house, that's, that's what you're dealing with. And when I'm walking through and there's flies everywhere and, and you're dealing with the smells of dead chickens and you're just doing all that and there's mice, you're sweating, it just always makes me think of this, these plagues of flies that I eventually, thank goodness, get out of the chicken house and do something else the rest of the day and so I don't have to deal with it. But I could imagine just having flies like that, I mean, because of just everything else that's around it. Um, there's dead livestock, it's telling us, with plagues. So, I mean, there has to be terrible smells flies everywhere. So it just reminds me of that, uh, that plague of the flies when I walk through there that I can get reprieved by eventually leaving the chicken house, but the Egyptians, it just was there to stay, and that God was sending these plagues uh, to the Egyptians. And so as I was doing studying, two questions came to my mind as I was doing some reading and reading some commentaries and doing some studying myself, was 
why was there 10 plagues? And again, this is a question I'm just asking. The Bible doesn't directly tell us that, but it was interesting as, as I was doing some studying, I came across something that I, I found fascinating. It says if there's only one or two plagues, it could have been easily chalked up to a natural disaster that had occurred, that had occurred rather than the sovereign hand of God being able to deliver the Israelites out of Egypt like he promised to do. When you get 10 plagues, and we'll learn at the end here, even the Egyptians recognized this was from the hand of God. And so with that, there's no question when all these things were happening, and actually if you read through the plagues, some of the Egyptian leaders were telling Pharaoh, this is God, like why don't you just give in? And, and Pharaoh, he, he didn't. He, he just kept going, and he wasn't willing to give in. And it makes me wonder, why did Pharaoh not want to give in after any of the plagues? You get through so many, and you think you, think you had enough. Um, but I think what it came down to was that Pharaoh trusted himself more than God. He thought he was in more control of his life than he really was. And I think in life, sometimes we can be able to look at life, and we can think or assume that we're in more control than what, what we really are and, the only way we, we, we really learn that is, is the hard way, right? When we all of a sudden realize we're not in control, something happens with that. But we see that God delivered his people by using plagues, and he provided by being able to do that for the Israelites. The second thing I'd like to share with you in which God provided for as the people being able to get them to be able to exit Egypt was that God provided physical protection for the Israelites. By God protecting his people, it made Moses a busy man. Because of that, he had to go and deliver two separate messages to people because of God protecting his people. And I'd like to share each message with you and to be able to kind of share the results of what took place. And we're up in Exodus chapter 11 now, so we're getting close to the final plague of what's going to be taking place. So Moses has a job to go speak to Pharaoh. And I think this is not an easy job to do. Imagine going to a leader and you're going to tell him bad news. And God's telling you to do that. And if you remember earlier, Moses was telling Pharaoh this stuff and it wasn't going good. And Moses easily got discouraged. And so he goes to Pharaoh in Exodus chapter 11, verses 1 to 6. This is what he says. Now the Lord had said to Moses, I will bring one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that, he will let you go from here. And when he does, he will drive you out completely. Tell the people that men and women alike are to ask their neighbors for articles of silver and gold. The Lord made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people. And Moses himself was highly regarded in Egypt by Pharaoh's officials and by the people. So Moses said, this is what the Lord says. About midnight, I will go throughout Egypt. Every firstborn son in Egypt will die. From the firstborn son of Pharaoh, who sits on the throne, to the firstborn son of the female slave, who is at her handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle as well, there will be loud wailing throughout Egypt, worse than there ever been or ever will be again. Powerful verse there. So Moses delivers that message. That wasn't fun to do. That's not something anyone else was signing up or Aaron was saying, I'll, I'll, I'll do that for you, Moses. But then he gets to message number two, and he has to speak to the Israelites, and he sends, he, he sends a little bit different of a message. So listen as I read Exodus chapter 12, verses 21 to 23. It says, Then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it into the blood in the basin, and put some of the blood on top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. When the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on top and sides of the door frame and will pass over the doorway. And he will not permit the destroyer to enter and strike you down. So two completely different messages. Goes to Pharaoh saying, hey, bad news. This is what's going to happen. And then he goes to the Israelites and says, hey, guys, here's what's going to happen. Something good is going to happen, but you, you have some responsibility that you need to do and make sure that you do it. Don't forget. And so before we go into the results, as I was studying this, I decided I, to take a time out. I, I like sports, and all of a sudden I'm, I'm listening to these two different messages. A lot of questions and a lot of thoughts are, are going through my mind, both 
for Moses, for Pharaoh, for the Egyptians, of, of what is going through their mind. So first, I want to just wonder what the Egyptians were thinking. So it, it says Pharaoh was told of the news that the firstborn was going to be killed. And so it makes me wonder, did word travel, did the Egyptians know that night when they went to bed of what was going to happen? The, the word of God doesn't directly tell us that, but it just makes you wonder, did word get out when families went to bed at night and, you know, getting near midnight, were people getting up, were they checking bedrooms, were you, you know, is everyone okay, is everyone here, how's it all going? And so, you know, were the, were the Egyptians panicked at all or were they kind of just, they went to their homes and thought nothing of it? and uh, being able to, to not really worry about it. For me, I, after seeing nine plagues, it would get me to kind of stop and say, you know, hey, might want to take us a little serious. Um, but the other thing I wonder about the Egyptians is if when they looked over into Goshen and saw all the Israelites and they saw all of the lambs that got slaughtered, they, each family had to slaughter a perfect lamb. And it says when they, when they exited Egypt, there were 600,000 men and then their wives and children. So if each family needed to have a perfect lamb, that's thousands upon thousands of lambs. So the Egyptians would have to be thinking or seeing, realizing there's a bunch of dead lambs, or missing lambs at least, looking around of what there was before. And then they're seeing the Israelites going, and they're taking the blood, and they're putting it on the door frames, on top, and on the sides. And, you know, I'm sure it got them talking, what are they doing? Why are they doing that? Maybe asking themselves, maybe we should be doing that. You know, what's going on here? Uh, why is this happening? And so those are my questions that I have for the Egyptians. What was processing through their mind? Did they, did they know this was coming? And when that happened, the second person I have questions for is Pharaoh. What was Pharaoh thinking? If I'm told that my oldest was going to die, and I saw nine other plagues, like I told earlier, come to fruition, went that, 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 would, that would stop me in my tracks. Um, like I told you um, our family, we are trying to deal with the stomach bug, so I wanted to have both my boys here tonight to come and just be a part of it. But my oldest, John's here. John, do you want to stand up a second? So he's here with us tonight. So I just want to share, like for me, if I'm told my firstborn something's going to happen, Pharaoh had to just have the pride and uh, just ego of being able to think he was just, um, you know, sliced bread or something because I hear that noise and saying that's going to happen all of a sudden, I'm like, let's go to the, let's go to the, the uh, table to negotiate. Because all of a sudden, you know, I, let's talk. I don't want to see that happen. Let's talk. Pharaoh made no mention that it seems like he wasn't, he wasn't bothered by that. He was willing to be able to continue on. And, uh, like, he was going to deal with what was going on. And so my phrase here is, I think Pharaoh puts a stubborn Dutchman to shame. I, I can be one of them, uh, how we can be set in our ways. And Pharaoh, you saw nine plagues, and you're told this is going to happen. What makes you think that something different is going to happen? And again, I told you earlier, Pharaoh, to his people, they thought he was God. All right, so all of a sudden, if he loses face with his people, a different, a different God was able to defeat him. He looks like a nobody. Um, but when you see nine things happen like that, it just makes you wonder, what was Pharaoh thinking? Why, why was he not willing to be able to stop? It says the Lord hardened his heart, um, but with Pharaoh, he must have been really so self-consumed that there wasn't a whole lot of convincing that probably had to be done because of Pharaoh thinking of who he was. So that brings us to the results. Exodus chapter 12, verses 29 to 33, here's what happened. It says, At midnight the Lord struck down all the firstborn in Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh, who sat on the throne, to the firstborn of the prisoner, who was in the dungeon, and the firstborn of all the livestock as well. Pharaoh and all his officials and all the Egyptians got up during the night, and there was loud wailing in Egypt, like there was not without a house with someone dead. During the night, Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and said, Up, leave my people, you and the Israelites. Go, worship the Lord as you've requested. Take your flocks and herds, as you said, and go. And bless me. The Egyptians urged the people to hurry and leave the country, for otherwise they said, We will all die. The Israelites did as Moses instructed and asked the Egyptians for articles of silver and gold and for clothing. The Lord had made the Egyptians favorably disposed towards the people and gave them what they asked for 
so they plundered the Egyptians. So not only did God provide protection for the Israelites, he also gave them goods from the Egyptians, gold, silver, clothing. And so the Egyptians said, please leave our country. We've seen enough of this. We don't want anything more. We're all going to die. Take our stuff and leave. And uh, Pastor Jesse is going to be continuing on next week and talking about with the Red Sea. So I don't want to go too far into that. Um, but they leave with lots of wealth. And uh, God has that and can be able to use that. But God protected Israel. They, they put the blood up. And the Egyptians, like it said back in uh, Scripture, it says there was wailing like that has never been heard before, never heard again. Not one household was not impacted by the tenth plague. So, I don't know if you, know, you guys know a lot about me, um, a little bit about my story. So tomorrow, um, in a week, tomorrow, so the 13, 14th, um, is going to be a six-year anniversary that my daughter, Chelsea, she was, she was stillborn just short of 34 weeks of pregnancy, and uh, one of the things I won't forget of, of going through the process was that I remember when we were um, out at the um, cemetery and uh, for the funeral, I remember being there and I remember carrying my daughter Chelsea's casket to the burial plot to be buried. And I remember just a lot of why questions in, in my mind because there was no signs till afterwards that... Uh, she was stillborn and had died, and you know there was nothing problematic leading up to it, and so it just leads your mind to ask lots of why questions. You know, you don't understand, and as people, we want to understand and, and figure things out. And so, doing all this, not understanding why this is all happening, um, and and just really confused by it, and not being in control. And so I asked the question earlier tonight. You know, when we think we're in control, the times we realize we're not in control is usually during difficult circumstances. The struggle I have is that going through a personal situation I had, didn't know it was coming, you face it, and you actually just ask lots of why questions of why is this happening, but coming to a point where you're not going to live with happiness by just asking why questions that you won't have the answers for. But here's where my struggle continues, though, is that with Pharaoh... Pharaoh was told what was going to happen. He told that one of his children was going to die, and he did nothing to stop it. He did nothing to stop it. So again, I think it goes back to that pride and arrogance to where Pharaoh really thought he was God. He was in control. He was going to do what he wanted, and he didn't realize that the God of the Israelites, when he says he's going to set his people free, he does what he says, and he did it. And so Pharaoh had to face the consequences of his poor decisions. But that leads us to our third and final truth about how God provides during the exodus of God's people. And it's that God provides an eternal plan of salvation. In Exodus chapter 12, we see that only one thing could save the Hebrew slaves from judgment in Israel. It was substituted blood from a lot of perfect lambs. So I shared earlier that each home had to be able to kill a perfect lamb, take the blood, and to be able to put it on the door frame to be able to tech, protect the families that night so that they were saved. And see, the Passover in the Old Testament there in Exodus is a foreshadow of what God is eventually going to do later on by sending his one and only son, Jesus. And with that, it helps us better understand that um, Pastor Paul preached this past weekend and he talked about the goodness of God and he was in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, Genesis 3 and when you're in Genesis 1, Genesis 2 the world's a pretty great, perfect place but the problem is when we get to Genesis 3 all of a sudden sin enters the world and all of a sudden the world's a different place than what God had originally intended and created and so therefore God had to then begin this redemptive story by being able to do something so that he could rescue man um, because of our sin. We were lost in our sin. There was nothing that we could do. And so God put into motion a plan to be able to, to save us. And so the beautiful thing about what God did is, is we look at the Old Testament and we can ask a lot of why questions. Like there's a bunch of stories, a bunch of 
interesting things happen. There's a bunch of laws and um, all, these, all these situations that go on, and, and what's the purpose? And the Old Testament is really pointing people to look towards the coming Messiah that God was sending, having people have faith that God's going to be sending a Savior. And in John chapter 1, verses 29, I, this verse I wanted to read to you, it goes perfect with what we're saying. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Israelites had to use thousands and thousands of lambs to save themselves for one night. After that, it wasn't any good. God sent his son Jesus to die. He sent one lamb, one time, perfect lamb, and it was to save us from our sins. And so the Israelites, back at the Passover, they had to have faith in a substitute blood to be able to save them that night when the destroyer was coming. For us sitting here today and for all people, we have to have faith in a substitute blood that's going to save us from our sins because we can't save ourselves. Our blood, we're, we're sinful people. It was only through Jesus with his perfect blood that we were able to have opportunity to come to a saving faith as Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So I'm looking at a bunch of guys tonight, and I'm guessing most of you accepted the Lord as your Savior. So I'm not here trying to be able to do a gospel presentation necessarily. But what I am trying to say is that I'm sure each one of you have men, family, people in your lives that have not put their faith in a substitute blood to save them from their sins. And so my challenge is tonight, just as God had saved the Israelites back in Egypt and brought them out, is that God's still in the business of being able to save people and he's doing it today by people putting their faith and trust in Jesus. And so just challenge you that um, our men's group is a wonderful ministry. I know Todd talked earlier about we have our Good Friday breakfast and opportunities, the retreat, where we can do life with men and opportunities where we can have men who aren't saved and they can come hear uh, the good news and uh, to be able to put their faith in a substitute blood because our blood, it won't cut it. And so with that, I just challenge you uh, just recognize where you're at, where God has you, the people he's put in your life, and uh, make the most of those opportunities um, because as we learned in Egypt, God provided then, and uh, he still He provides and cares for us today. So with that, will you join with me in a word of prayer? Father God, we are thankful that ultimately you are the great provider and that just like you did back in Egypt, you provided and you did exactly what you said you were going to do we're thankful that over 2,000 years ago, the same thing when you sent your one and only son, Jesus, to die for our sins and to save us because we are incapable of doing that ourselves, that you said what you were going to do, and Jesus went, and he did that on our behalf. And so we are thankful, thankful that we have hope. So as we gather here tonight, and we have men's group, and we fellowship, that we do it with that a future and a hope. And I just pray that as they're in their small groups tonight and have discussions, Lord, that as we do life and as we go through life, Lord, there can be trials where sometimes we can be stubborn, we can be discouraged, um, we can be able to not trust with that you're going to do what you said you're going to do, Lord. So just give us um, eyes to see and faith, Lord, uh, that you are who you are. And I just pray for a great discussion and uh, just be with the men the rest of the week, Lord, as they go about their lives. Uh, their work family, Lord, that you would just be with them. And again, opportunities that we have to be able to tell people about the good news of your son, Jesus. And so we thank you for that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Pastor Jared, uh, for sharing your message and for sharing a little bit of your story. I know that um, Pastor O'Care is is one of uh, Pastor Jared's primary focuses and uh, and he is able to care so deeply because of his life experiences. And uh, he doesn't take for granted, I know that from my own personal experience with him, uh, the experiences that the Lord has put in his, you know, journey. So just uh, appreciate you. And uh, also appreciate that you weren't sick today and I didn't have to try to do the message. Um, <laughs> so... Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, this is the part where we break into small groups. Uh, we just kind of scatter throughout the church. So if there's somebody that you were greeted by today that you want to just follow them and you don't know where else to go, go ahead and do that. If not, come see me and I'll tell you where to go. So 
Have a good night.